Yeah. 
just heard him say, he's singing back to us. Cause I'm pouring out my love on you. I'm pouring out my praise on you. I'm pouring out my love on you. Cause I'm I just heard him as we were singing that, I heard him saying that back to us. As we're pouring it out, he's pouring his love back on us. He's constantly pouring out on us, constantly praising, giving us praise, giving us encouragement, loving us, caring for us. He's pouring out, he's pouring out, he's pouring out, oh yeah, cause he's pouring out his love. just to praise, just praise me, cause you make mountains move, you make giants fall, you sing songs of praise to shake prison walls, so I will speak to my fears, I will Preach to my doubts. You've been faithful, man, and you'll be faithful now. Come on, you may, because you make mountains move. You make jump. Oh, it's what you do best. Songs of praise to shake prison walls. So I will speak. of my doubts and you may pray for them you'll be faithful he makes mountains cause you make mountains move you make giants fall you use songs of 
come on, more than conquerors. Can you give him a praise break right now? Praise him for everything he's conquered through with you. Yeah, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you're a constant. You're a constant. When we're going through so much, God, and it feels like a rope, it feels like we're going up and down, up and down in seasons, God. Thank God that you are constant through all of it. You're faithful through all of it. Thank you, God, that I've seen it in the past, and I'm going to see it again. That you're not done doing miracles. That you don't go, get old with it, and there's nothing new that you can do. You're always being creative and doing a new miracle. And even when we least expect it, that's when we see you move, God. So we thank you, God, for your constant support, your love, your care for us. We thank you, Jesus, this morning. You know, Psalm 27, seems like the Lord keeps bringing me back to that. You know, first verse, everybody knows by heart, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But then, there is a second verse that says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And I feel so strong how that connection is from verse 1 to verse 2. You know, he, first he starts saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right? And then he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And it's so amazing to see how he connects that. Because if the Lord's your shepherd, you shall not want. He's talking about all the things that you need. Amen? Amen? But then he says, he makes you lie down in green pastures. He makes you. I love that. He makes you. It's not a choice. It's <laughs> he makes you. <laughs> Amen? Because what he wants to do in your life is to bring you to rest. He makes me lie down. Right? You lie down because you want to rest. So the Lord is... You know, for 20 years, he keeps telling me, I'm going to teach you to rest. And guess what? I'm still learning. Because <laughs> we keep forgetting that the Lord is my shepherd. That comes first. And then he makes me lie down. First thing he, he says is, he's my shepherd. And then he says, I shall not want. So I don't need to worry. I can actually lie down. But the reason why he makes me lie down is because he already shows me that he is my shepherd. That's why he says he makes me lie down. Because when he comes to you as a shepherd and he makes sure that every need is provided for, that's when he makes you lie down. Because he already showed you. And I love this song that we've been singing. He is faith, was faithful then and he'll be faithful now. He will continue to be the Lord, the shepherd. And I love that says, he makes me lie down, not just lie down in any place, in green pastures. That means something fresh, something new, and food. Amen? He will always bring you to the place where you will be satisfied in his presence. That's when you, you know, we think that we're going to be satisfied We have when we have all the money we need or even more in the bank. Hello? How many of you already had that and were still not satisfied? How many of you work for people who has that even more? And they are not satisfied. Because what satisfies you is not what you have in your bank account. What satisfies you is knowing that the Lord is your shepherd. That you have a shepherd that will take care of you every morning. That's why it says green pasture. Every morning the Lord will provide. Every morning he will bring the grace that you need, the mercy that you need, the favor that you need. Come on. Every single morning you will encounter the green pastor and he makes you lie down. He wants to bring his church, his body to that place. 
to that place of trust, to that place of rest in every area of our lives, but especially in the finances. That's the place that can take us out of the rest many times. Amen? Can you agree with that? Oh, it's just me. <laughs> we all, when we go through finances challenges, we always walk out of the rest that God has been calling us to. He's bringing us. He's actually forcing us to. I remember when he told me, I'm, I'm going to shake everything until you learn to trust me, to rest, to know that I am your shepherd. I am your God. I'll be there for you. And it has been 20 years, and he's still teaching me. But guess what? He's still there. He's still making me lie down in green pastures. He's still showing me that those pastures are green. Even though, you know, we tend to look and see the gray, the, the, the brown, the, you know, you know, we always look for something, right? If you're like me, you're always going to look for the negative. But that's not who our God is, and that's not where he's bringing us to. He's bringing us to a place of rest. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he satisfies our soul. Amen. He is the only one who can satisfy. So when we give to him, we give out of that understanding that he already provides. And this morning when I woke up, there was already green pastures for me to lay down. There was already a place that I could find my shepherd and I shall not want. So as you give to the Lord this morning and there are different ways you can give. You can bring it here. You can give through those ways. I want you to remember this. He is making me this morning lie down in green pastures. He's calling me to rest, to the place where I trust the shepherd who promised me that I shall not want. There are other translations that say I will lack nothing. So that's the Lord. Amen. So I want us to sing that again. You make mountains move. He's the one who is doing all that. And he was faithful then, and he'll be faithful now. Amen. for your faithfulness that we have constantly seen every single day of our lives how faithful you are and yes thank you for the green pastures Lord. thank you for making us lie down to learn to rest you and as you know we know more of you the more we will rest the more we will trust and we thank you for it in Jesus name and everyone says amen would you give him praise come on oh sorry sorry guys forgetting Pastor Aldo is going to pray for us. I told my wife um, every Sunday I'm going to give you if, you if you could stand, it would be great. I want to give you the word about healing because I told my wife I'm not the healer. I can't convince you anything about healing. I'm just a messenger. But I said the only thing that's going to convince you and 
impart faith to you is the word of God. That has the power to open our hearts and help us to receive what Jesus has for us. So I take five minutes every time on Sunday to give you the word, what the word says concerning your physical healing. In Matthew 14, 14, it says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. What God spoke to me to tell you this morning is that when it comes to healing, there is nothing that you can do other than believe him to receive your healing. You're not going to get healed because you deserve your healing. You get healed because Jesus had compassion. He's compassionate. Every time he healed, it was because of love and compassion. Everyone that he healed when he was walking on the earth never deserved the healing. Absolutely not. <laughs> so he healed because he loved people and he still loves people. He heals because he is full of compassion towards you. So what's going to heal us physically? It's not how good of a Christian we are, what we did, what we didn't do. It has nothing to do with our performance. It has to do with the fact that Jesus is full of compassion towards us. He loves us. And that if we put our faith in him, see all these people who were undeserving at that time, they all went to him. <laughs> That's faith. By you going to Jesus, that is faith in action. And that's what he responds to, is faith. That's all he wants from us, is faith. So this morning, if you need healing in your body, don't focus on what you can do for Jesus, or what you have done for Jesus, or something from your part. Focus on what he did for you. And focus on the compassion he has towards you. And put your eyes on him and go to him believing that if you believe that he is your healer and he is compassionate towards you, healing will, healing will flow quickly to your body. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Praise God. Amen. And the good news is that also that he hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. I think I said that two weeks ago when God spoke to me early in the morning uh, in the bathroom. He said, I haven't changed. I've never changed. So that means we change, but he is still the same. So if he is still that compassionate Savior that was healing all those who were afflicted with diseases yesterday, he is still the same today. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So if you have any pain in your body, any infection, inflammations in the joints, ligaments, tendons, muscle, muscle aches. That's what I felt God wanted to heal this morning. Uh, back issues, any pain in your body that you're experiencing right now, he wants to heal that. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. See, he's already pouring healing out right now. Glory to Jesus. Praise you, Father. Father, yes, there you go. Father, heal them. Lord, I release your healing over their bodies. In Jesus' name, the, over the tendons, over the muscles, bones, the marrows. Father, every area of their body, Father, their back, their discs. Jesus' name, I command them all to be healed. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Just say now, I receive my healing, Lord. It's mine. <laughs> I take it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'll thank him for it. Thank you for my healing. 
thank you for my healing, even right now, Lord. Even right now. Even right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for it, Lord. Now do something you couldn't do before. That's faith. Get out in the aisle. If you couldn't run, run. Or lean over, bend over. Do something you couldn't do. Go ahead. How many, how many felt something change in your body? Raise your hand if you felt something change in your body. You felt it? Abundant, the power of God is all over you. <laughs> Hallelujah, it's all over you. Praise God. What you have? You had back issues? The abundant? Those back issues? Your arms, legs and arms. It was? Come over here. Is it still there? hurt you? It's better? <laughs> oh, it's always a lot of pain in the morning, but now it's better? <laughs> it's gone. All right, let's, hallelujah. That's it. That's it. It's yours. Woo, glory to God. It's yours, completely yours. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father, that all the inflammation is gone. Hallelujah. And your physical, woo, glory to God. I feel it too. Thank you, Father. Thank you. So you were in pain when you came this morning? Okay. Really? And now you're? Sounds good. All right. <laughs> Amen. All right. Anybody else? Yeah, you came this morning with pain? Muscle aches, back aches, back problems. If you have an issue, if, you, if it still hurts, come over here. We're going to pray. And you're going to be healed. Anybody else? No? Okay. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Amen. You see, God is raising our level of faith in this area. Every Sunday, I'm going to give you a passage verse of the word because it's the word of God that has the power to get rid of the unbelief in our hearts she does and establish faith into our hearts oh that's from writing that Harley Davidson <laughs> four hours on a Harley to Daytona and back that'll cripple anyone <laughs> it's hurting isn't it come over here I want you to do me a favor. Sit down over here, Ellen. Sit straight, as straight as you can, and raise your hand. Raise your hand. Oh, my gosh. There's your problem. This right leg is about two inches longer than this one. Did you know that? There you go. Well, well today is going to be the last day. It's going to be the last day of the suffering. Hey, brother, come over here. I want you to see a miracle. Straight as it could be. You felt it. It was going this way. It was going out. Yeah. See now? Same thing. You're, you had a severe curvature in your back. And it was causing this leg, the right leg, to be two inches shorter. And what happens is you begin to walk like this. And it puts a strain on the other side. And that's where the pain comes. Now stand to your feet. <laughs> now you can ride more motorcycle, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'll let I'll let your wife answer that. <laughs> can you stretch now? You can. You couldn't go that far. See now you can. Wow, you were out there at the door greeting people, and, and uh, Sylvia, you went out there for, to call her, right? Thank you, Sylvia. Oh, praise the Lord. You will never have that again. Amen.
No more complaining. <laughs> I tell him you need to buy a gold wing. <laughs> A couch on two wheels <laughs> with a cup holder. <laughs> Praise God. Greet the person by your side and welcome them here this morning. Amen. God bless. All right, all right. What's up, guys? So we have some quick announcements. I'm your host for announcements today <laughs> before we get ready for the word. So the quick announcements is Wednesdays. Who's been listening on Wednesdays? I've been listening on the Zoom, so that's the awesome thing. If you can't make it here, it's also live on Zoom. And it's been, I um, want to make sure I got it right, training for raining which has been awesome, especially like you leave work, you're kind of stressed out, and you need to fill yourself up again with his word. It's been amazing. So it's Wednesday night, 7.30. You could come here, or it's also live on Zoom. And then also Sunday mornings. Do you guys remember what we're, the main topic is about? Nobody? People matter. Awesome. So yeah, I've been learning a lot about that because I usually think I matter, I matter, right? So God's like, but people matter too, you know? So, so it's been really good. Sunday mornings at 10, um, we're going to keep, he's going to keep preaching on that, um, which is amazing because we need to hear, because when God's speaking to us, when we're learning so much how God loves us, then we start learning, hey, God also loves other people too. <laughs> so we're going to continue on that. And so are you guys ready for today? to learn about why people matter. <laughs> so if you guys can welcome my dad, Pastor Aldo. <laughs> hey, everybody. Good morning. God bless you. Good to see you here today. We're going to be continuing a series called People Matter. And today we're going to be dealing with the subject of forgiveness. 
So it's going to be called Let It Go. Let it go. And as Christians, believers, we can let it go. But before we get into today's message, I just want to share with you about next week's message. It's going to be called One for All and All for One. One for All and All for One. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 that says this. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. We're going to be dealing next week with divisions. Not in the church. We're not having that problem, thank God. But we live in a divided nation. Our nation, unfortunately, right now is divided. You got those who are saying, and you know, um, unless you're vaccinated, you're the cause of this problem. So now we have divisions, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And this is all coming from our federal government, unfortunately. They're creating this division. Thank God we have a governor that stands up for us. We have critical race theory that is being taught to some of our kids in school, which is completely racist, racist. It's putting white kids against black, blaming white kids for racism when they have nothing to do with this. It's Marxism. That's what it is. So unfortunately, we have a government that's trying to exert all kinds of controls and manipulate and infiltrate our minds and our societies to control but we can fight back. And the church of Jesus Christ was not called to allow this kind of mentality to influence it. Because if we allow this, then all of a sudden we're going to be in church separating ourselves based on politics. And politicians, oh, I'm of this group and you're of that group that way. This way we don't associate with each other. So if we're not careful, this can infiltrate the church. When the church is supposed to be united because of Jesus Christ, not because of a political party, but because of Jesus, we are united. And we need to be an example to the world of what it is to be under one roof, one people, no matter what color skin you are, background or culture you're from, we can all be one and we are all one under Jesus Christ. No one is better than each other. We're all the same. And we need, we need to show that example to the world. The world needs to see that. So I'm going to be dealing with that. And the Bible says that we need to be united in heart and in mind. So I'm going to teach you what that means. So that way none of this division that is in our nation, as a matter of fact, it's in the world, will infiltrate and affect the church. Amen? But today we're going to let it go. <laughs> Say with me, I'm going to let it go. I think I shared with you last week how this all began, this message. A few years ago, I was at Animal Kingdom at Disney World, and they were starting the show Frozen back then. Today, it's at Hollywood Studios. Back then, it was starting at Animal Kingdom, and it was a pilot show. It was packed. I was sitting way in the back in the bleachers, and when they began to sing this sing-along, let it go, let it go, <laughs> I sang along happily, joyfully. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a cute song. But as I looked to my right, I saw men, grown men, and their wives crying, weeping. Let it go. <laughs> I'm going to let it go. Are you going to let it go? I'm going to let it go. I'm like, what are you letting go of? What's, what's, <laughs> that's what I thought. First of all, I thought it was a little comical how a grown person could be crying over a song at Disney. But then I began to reflect on what was really going on. These people are hurting. They're carrying hurts, baggages, stuff around that they don't know how to get rid of. And this song, Let It Go, which has to do with a rebellious queen, (laughs) 
okay, rebelling against the government and the institution at the time, was somehow speaking to these people about letting go of whatever was binding them and holding them back. So I understood what was going on, but what was really happening there is they were venting and trying to let go of something that was holding them bound in their emotions and in their hearts. But that's all it was, was emotion. Because only true liberty and forgiveness is not just emotional. It is spiritual. It is powerful. It is by the Holy Spirit. Jesus gives us that power. Jesus is the only one who gives us the ability to forgive from the heart. So I was impacted by that scenario. And that, was, that is what led me to choose this um, title for today's message called Let It Go. Because just like those grown men watching the show Frozen had to let go of some things, I believe today many of you have to let go of some things as well. There's a, story, there's a story about a man called Gary Edwards. <clears throat> His fan was bitten by a dog who had rabies. <clears throat> the man was rushed to the hospital, and the test revealed that he too had contracted this dreadly disease of rabies. This was back in the day when there was really no cure for this disease. So the doctor had the unfortunate task of informing this patient that his disease was terminal and incurable. He said, we'll try to make you as comfortable as we can, but I strongly suggest that you get your affairs in order as quickly as possible. The man was stunned. He didn't know what to do. And finally, after a few moments, he summoned the strength to get a pen and a piece of paper, and he began to write furiously. About an hour later, the doctor came back to check on his patient. The man was still writing. The doctor said, well, I'm glad to see that you're getting your will in order. The man looked up at the doctor and said, doc, this ain't no will. This is the list of the people that I'm going to bite before I die. <clears throat> Are you getting ready to bite some people? Yeah. We may not go after people to bite them, but we do bite them, not with our teeth, but with our tongue and with our attitudes and with our ways. Colossians 3.13 says this, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So the key for forgiveness from the heart is knowing how much the Lord forgave you. That's the key. Isn't it what it says in the scripture? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So this level of forgiveness that God wants you to experience can only come at that level once you understand what you were forgiven for by the Lord. That understood, understanding opens your heart to forgive others like you have been forgiven. A lot of people fail to see this. They venture out trying to forgive people out of their emotions. And what happens is they have an emotional high at the moment, but a week later, when they find out something else that that person did, <laughs> it will seem like he or she never did forgive in the first place. And that's the truth. He never did really forgive from the heart. So a deep level forgiveness coming from the heart, from the bowels of your soul, only comes as we understand how much we have been forgiven. 
So that's what I'm going to teach you here this morning. Symptoms of unforgiveness are undeniable. You can't smother it. You can't hide it. It will pop its head sooner or later. It will show up. It will cause you to be distant from people. If you have a habit of avoiding people, then you have to check and see if there is any issue in your heart towards people. Because once you get hurt, you get offended, you get wounded, your tendency is, if not healed properly, is to withdraw from people because you're afraid you're going to get hurt again by people. Bring anger and bitterness into every relationship and new experience. You know, bitterness is interesting because bitterness is anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly. So at some point in your life you felt like you were being treated unfairly, maybe by your employer. He wasn't pay, you felt like he wasn't paying you enough for the work that you did and you harbored unforgiveness towards him or her. It could be in a romantic relationship with your husband, your wife, or with your boyfriend or girlfriend. It could be a, a family relationship, friendships. You know, if you are not careful, you can allow offense to get into your heart because you feel like you have been treated unfairly. So bitterness is the end result of anger that has not been expressed. When you fail to vent your anger the right way, not breaking windows and knocking people unconscious on the floor, but when you fail to vent your anger the proper way, and you try to hide it and smother it, that will convert into bitterness. So if you are bitter here today, it's because you have hidden anger in your heart. You've never allowed Jesus Christ to heal you of those anger and those offenses in your heart. You become wrapped up in the wrong that you can enjoy the present. You're so consumed about what happened to you that you have no pleasure or joy in the today. You, get, you go to the mall, but you have no pleasure being there. You go to an amusement park, but you have no joy in being there. You go to the movies with your friends or with your family, but you don't enjoy the time together. What's going on? It's because you are so wrapped up in what happened to you that you can't enjoy relationships or your own very life. You become depressed and anxious. Depression has a lot of roots. It can be chemical imbalances, but it's, there's also emo emotional roots involved. Depression and anxiety can come because of unforgiveness. Loss, valuable. Lose valuable and enriching connectedness with others. You have difficulty connecting with other people, loving other people. Being around other people. You can't connect. <laughs> you have difficulty connecting. That's all a sign of unforgiveness in your heart. Okay? There's an article by John Hopkins Hospital. And in the medical field, they can attest to this. They, he says this, and it's, a, it's an article by Karen Swartz. Uh, she's a medical doctor. And she's a director of disorders and in the adult clinic at this hospital. And she said that chronic anger puts you in a fight or flight mode, which results in numerous changes in heart rate, blood pressure, immune response. And those changes then increase the risk of depression, heart disease, diabetes, among other conditions. And she said forgiveness. Now, this is a doctor, a secular doctor. She said forgiveness, however, calms stress levels leading to improved health. This is a doctor, a medical doctor who has no connection with spiritual things. And she's saying, forgiveness is good for you. It's good for your soul. And it's good for your body as well. I liken forgiveness as a prescription from heaven. <laughs> we should never allow forgiveness to come after years of suffering. Like a man who hates to go to the doctor. 
You know, guys hate that, right? We prolong it, prolong it, prolong it. Finally, we can't take it anymore. That's when we go. <laughs> Some of us treat forgiveness like that. We prolong it, prolong it, prolong it. And then finally, when we can't take it anymore, when we can't sleep at night, when we are depressed and anxious, we have physical problems now, we finally decide to deal with the situation. What took you so long? God wants us to apply forgiveness and live in a forgiveness mode every day of our lives. As the Apostle Paul says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So that's the time limit that God gives us. Before you go to bed at night, go pray, check your heart, make sure your heart is clean. Amen. Unforgiveness will always surface given the opportunity. It will always surface. Always. You can't hide it. Okay. In Matthew chapter 18 verse 15, it says this. If, you, if your brother sins against you, go and show him, him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I'll tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay. Here is Jesus' is dealing with relationship problems in the church. And he gives the church instructions on what to do, etc., concerning relational problems. Right after that, Peter asks this question in verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall we forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. So this instruction on forgiveness pulled out of Peter... Some unforgiveness. <laughs> so unforgiveness will always surface when given the opportunity. It could be watching a movie that brings some scenes that makes you remember an event in your life with someone or some people. It could be the smell of a perfume that traces your mind back to a person that used to wear that perfume. And then you still have a grievance over it. It could be the name of the person which has the same name as the person who betrayed you, hurt you deeply, stole from you. <laughs> there are so many triggers, so many that can cause the unforgiveness to surface in your life. But see, that's not bad. That is actually good. Because what you're trying to hide and ignore, it only goes to show you that given the right opportunity, it will show up for your good. So you would see that you do have a problem and that you need to allow God to deal with it. Amen. Amen. And that's exactly what happened with Peter. When Jesus began to talk about relationship issues in the church, guess what happened to him? He began to remember some issues that he had with some people in the synagogue. And then he says, okay, Lord, shall I forgive up to seven times? Peter thought he was being generous. Because, see, back in Amos, in the law of the prophets, it taught about how we need they need in the Old Testament to forgive up to three times. Three times was the limit. So if anybody sinned against you, offended you above three, you were free to do whatever you wanted. It's true. So the limit was three. I can forgive you up to three times. Anything above that gives me the right to punch you in the face. <laughs> That's Old Testament. So when Peter said, seven times, Lord, he thought he was being generous. 
And Jesus, of course, says to him, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. 490 times. So that means that we have to forgive people up to 490 times every day if necessary. Yes. But he wasn't giving us a number. He was giving us a principle. He was saying to us, no matter how much it takes and how long it takes, you need to do this every time you're offended. For your own good. Now, I heard somebody once say that unforgiveness is the poison that you drink, but you want the other person to die. And that's what it is. It's a poison that poisons your soul. And it strips you, robs you of whatever joy that you have. And it puts you in a very dark place. So there's nothing good in it. And it's not something that you want to hide and avoid. It's something that you want to allow um, to be dealt with. But see, the dealing with it is what makes it hard because we don't have the right tools. And Jesus gives us the right tools. He says, you're going to forgive like I forgave you. That's the tool. That's the tool that you use. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. The more you understand how much God forgave you of your sins, the quicker it will be for you to forgive. As a matter of fact, you'll be forgiven the moment you have become offended. As a matter of fact, your heart won't even allow offense to get in. You'll be shielded by such a strong wall of forgiveness that you will never allow forgiveness even to come in and entertain you again. That's how powerful it is when you understand how much God forgave you. Okay? So Peter was facing this dilemma. And Jesus wanted, of course, to teach him a lesson here. Just like he wants to teach all of us. Okay? He gives him a story. He begins to share with him a story about a king. And let's read this in verse 22. It says, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. <laughs> let him go? There you go. I never knew Frozen was in the Bible. There you go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. By the way, that's about $16. Okay. A hundred denarii today would be about $16. Grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had that man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I cancel all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Wow, those are some strong words. But don't fear, because I'm going to explain to you exactly what's going on here. First of all, the king here is God the Father, who forgave the debt of that servant. That forgiveness would have a value today, in today's money, of $16 billion. Or, no, I'm sorry, $6 billion billion dollars. 
more or less. So that is the kind of money that a servant in the king's household would never be able to repay. Which led me to think, how in the world did he run up such a large debt? What was he buying? <laughs> That's a different story. And then he was forgiven of that huge debt that he couldn't pay. Turns around and begins to demand the $16 that his servant wouldn't pay him. And by the way, the wages for servants back in those days was 16 cents a day. So it wasn't too large, but it was, a, you know, a sum that perhaps would require some time to pay back. So he demands from the man $16 to be repaid. And if he didn't, he would be thrown into prison. Exactly the same thing that he was facing with the king. So Jesus was giving us a point here. He was saying, how can you not forgive your servant who owed you so much less, who was in debt to you for so much less, okay? How could you not forgive him when I forgave you of so much more? So this is a picture of what God forgave us from. It's a difference between $6 billion and $16. So your unforgiveness towards somebody who offended you is a $16 offense. Your offense against God, the Bible calls us enemies of God before Christ saved us. Your offense against God was a $6 billion debt and offense. Which one is greater? Problem is we fail to see this. We think we're too good. So we see God, or us owing God $16, and others owing us $6 billion. That's the problem we have. We think we're too good. We think we're better than the other person who hurt us. Now, that person made a mistake. Whatever they did against you, it was a mistake. The hurt was real. But their hurt against you is not greater than what you did against God. Unless you see that, you will always have difficulty forgiving. Because you will always think that you're better than other people. And this king is a generous king. He's a kind-hearted king. So much so that he was willing to forgive the six billion just because the man humbled himself. Now, when it says that the king forgave, he didn't just wipe away that amount in the treasury of the kingdom. No, you don't just wipe away, erase the debt like we do in Washington. The king assumed the debt himself took the loss upon himself, which is exactly what Jesus did. It's a picture of the cross. Jesus assumed the debt that we had with God and we could never pay. Now, for those of you who have been here on Wednesday, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right, Deborah? Right, Carol? You know exactly what we've got because I've been teaching that on Wednesday. It's been powerful. So here is Jesus driving home the point and saying, Peter, <laughs> your debt with God is so much greater than your offense with that guy at the synagogue or in your fishing business. So you need to put your heart into perspective. And even though your offense is so much greater with God, he was willing to forgive you and release you of a debt that you could never pay in many lifetimes. Where is the gratefulness in your heart? Where is the humility in your heart, Peter? Where is the humility in your heart? See, once you understand this and put 
things into its proper perspective, then you're going to begin to see people differently. Then you know what's going to happen? The same compassion and love and forgiveness that was handed over to you, you'll be able to take that and hand it over to others. Because you can't give what you don't have. But if you don't feel like you've been given mercy and compassion and love, how are you going to give that to somebody else? You're not going to. So see, see how it's key here? See why Jesus said you got to forgive as I have forgiven you, as the Lord has forgiven you? So in this story, Jesus puts this in its proper place. So you understand this? The difference between your offense with God is a $6 billion forgiveness of offense versus a $16. So learn about what the king did for you. Receive what the king did for you. Believe in what the king did for you. Understand what the king did for you. He took your death. The curse that was on you came upon him. And the debt that you had with God because of sin, sin equals debt. He paid for you. He assumed it for you. So that you would never have to face that debt again. You were set free. Now you know where the Bible says, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. He freed you completely of all the debts that you had with the eternal God. Brought your account balance back to zero. Actually, he even went further. He gave you a plus. Because he didn't even take you to zero. He gave you his very righteousness. Now you're in the positive realm. <laughs> you have a surplus in your account. So he took you out of the red, brought you to zero, then gave you his righteousness, took you now in the black. Amen. <laughs> How can you not be grateful for that? You can unless you don't understand it or refuse it. If you refuse that or don't understand it, then you will never, ever forgive others from the heart. Because you don't know what it's like for you to be forgiven. And there's no amount of counseling Prayer, nothing will change that unless you understand what Jesus said. Forgive as I have forgiven you. So the key is for you to know how much he forgave you. And then forgiveness will come easy. It will flow out of your heart. Because how can you hold a grudge, no matter how grievous it is, against somebody when yours was far worse against God? So that servant had the legal right to demand from his other servant repayment, but he didn't have the moral right. He did not have the moral right. Why? Because he was forgiven. Now, that does not mean you allow people to hurt you over and over again so you can forgive them over and over again. That would be stupidity. At some point, you need to protect yourself. You need to guard yourself. You need to withdraw, maybe, perhaps, from that from the company of those people or do whatever it takes. But the reality is this. We're all going to face issues, problems, people, situations that's going to offend us. And when it does, we have to be ready to forgive instantly. Not allow the sun to go down on our wrath. Not forgiving hurts more the offended than it does the offender. Did you know that? The person who offended you is probably somewhere on the beaches of Hawaii, relaxing, get a, getting a gorgeous tan, and you're here fuming, angry, telling all the people around your life how 
that person hurt you. And he doesn't even care. And she doesn't even care. He doesn't even remember what happened. And yet, you're here, bent out of shape, incapacitated, can't sleep at night, high blood pressure, headaches all the time, depressed, and the other person is having his, the, the day of his life in Hawaii or in Minas Gerais. <laughs> Eating some picaya, some tutu. And can't even remember your name anymore. Because <laughs> for, for not forgiving will hurt the offended much more than the offender. So you don't want that. We don't want that. Let me give you some principles of forgiveness. We can't forgive because we have been forgiven. And that's the key. Remember, leave here remembering. If you don't remember anything that I just said, remember that part. Re um, understanding how much you've been forgiven is key. We can only forgive when we see ourselves being greatly forgiven. We free ourselves and others when we forgive. See, you don't just become free. You free others as well when you forgive them. As long as you hold a grudge against people, you hold everyone in bondage. Okay? We become the person we dwell on, either Christ or the person who hurt us. <laughs> okay? These are principles. When we forgive on a human level, we move out of the way and allow the Spirit of God to work. So that means that when you forgive the person... You're, you're, fr you're allowing yourself to be freed. And when that happens, the Spirit of God comes and begins to work on that individual. So everything that you're trying to do to make that person acknowledge your offense against you, how much they hurt you, everything you're trying to say and do, which is creating greater hurt and no results, okay, will only change when instead you simply forgive that person, walk away, go live your life, and allow the Holy Spirit to work. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit is going to do what you could never do, what you've been trying to do. Because you stepped out of the way, you forgave, as you have been forgiven. That's when God can begin to move. When we forgive, we are not excusing sin. On the contrary, we are acknowledging the sin that people have committed against us. So you're not ignoring the fact that you were deeply hurt or deeply offended and abused and, and uh, you were treated unfairly. You're not ignoring that. Actually, you are making it very clear. So it's not excusing sin or ignoring sin it is actually acknowledging that a sin did take place. And you choose to deal with it. But deal with it the proper way. Okay? Remember how the Bible says here, we just read it, that um, Jesus said, if you don't forgive, your Father in heaven also will not forgive you. Remember we, we read that? Verse 35, this is how your heavenly father will treat you, each of you, unless you forgive your brother from the heart. Well, this torture chamber, I've heard many versions of this, and people have, <laughs> sort of ignorant people have t taught, saying, see, this is Jesus saying that if you don't forgive, you're going to go to hell when you die. Well, I'm going to show you why I don't think that's exactly what Jesus was saying. First of all, this was in the Old Testament because the book of Matthew, although it is in your Bible in the category of New Testament books, the New Testament actually became in force at the resurrection. So Matthew, all the Gospels, the four Gospels, those are introduction. They're a bridge from the Old to the New. There's a lot of Old Testament scriptures there that was meant for Jews at that time. 
For example, in Matthew it says, if your hand offends you, cut it off. Who's going to be first? If your eye offends you, pluck it out. So if you look at that in the natural, it doesn't make any sense because even blind people have problems with the things that they can imagine in their heads. These are principles. And they were meant for Jews under law. Now, can we extract something out of it? Yes, we can. But we have to be careful because, remember, these books are bridges to what is yet to come, the New Testament. So we have to be careful how we apply it. We have to always compare it with the epistles and the New Testament authority as well. After, which I'm referring to the book of Acts and on. So what was Jesus saying here? This is what he was saying. Refusing to forgive puts us inside our own private torture chamber. That's what he was saying. And what happens is we begin to live those offenses day after day. You wake up in the morning, that offense is in your head. <laughs> you go to bed at night, that offense is still in your head. And it will continue there until you allow it to be dealt with. Now, speaking of forgiveness, I'm going to show you a couple of scriptures that talk about forgiveness. So that way you don't leave your thinking that because you are harboring unforgiveness in your heart, you're going to go to hell. No. You're going to create your own personal torture chamber. You're going to suffer, but you're not going to go to hell. Okay? Why is this? Colossians 2, 13 and 14. It says, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Okay? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. What did the Lord do for you? He forgave you. And when the Lord forgives, he never goes back on his forgiveness. Okay? Ephesians 4.31, it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as Christ in Christ God forgave you. You. Notice that he says, in Christ God, God is the king here in this story. God forgave you. Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. The Bible also says, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. I, already, I just gave you three scriptures. I could give you more. It talks about how God has forgiven you. So you're forgiven forever if you are in Christ. You're not going to go to hell. The Bible says he forgave us for everything that includes unforgiveness. Or else it wouldn't be total forgiveness. If there is one thing that he left out, then that would suspect me that there would be more things. Wouldn't it? So the New Testament makes it very clear. God forgave you for everything in Christ. Period. If you don't believe this then it's going to trouble you to forgive. It will actually work against you. Why? Because you're going to forgive because you're just afraid of going to hell. Oh, let me get rid of this. Okay, I forgive you. I forgive you. Whatever you did, I forgive you. Forgive you. you really? Yes. Don't you want to talk about it? No, you're forgiven. Because I don't know if I might die in 10 seconds, go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. For, for, you're forgiven. Did you really forgive? Was it from the heart? Did you deal with the situation? Did you vent? No. You did it because you were just afraid. That's not forgiveness. How does that go along with how Christ forgave you of everything? It doesn't, it doesn't connect. 
So for you to think that you're going to go to hell because you haven't forgiven anybody is a misunderstanding of Scripture. And that will short-circuit the true forgiveness that you can truly offer to the person based upon the forgiveness that you receive. You need to be free to approach your unforgiveness without any pressures of hell behind your back. Because Jesus dealt with that issue. You understand? So when you go to forgive somebody, you go, approach that person, not because you're so afraid, but because you want to extend to that person compassion and love and the same forgiveness that you received from the good-hearted king who forgave you of a debt that you could never repay. That's the motivation. And if you find yourself in a torture chamber today, that should be also a motivation for you to step out and say, how can I be in this situation when I've been forgiven of so much? And then move towards forgiveness. Now, keep in mind, forgiveness does not mean reconciliation. You may forgive somebody and never see that person again. Perhaps you don't want to see that person again. I don't know. But it doesn't mean reconciliation. It means you are releasing that person and closing the bookkeeping department of your heart. That's what it means. Now, if you become acquainted again, friends again, that's simply and utterly up to you. But it doesn't mean you have to. You may never see that person again, that's fine, as long as your heart is right. Now, what will you do with your servant who owes you a debt? Do you have anybody here who's like that servant who owes you a debt? Who offended you? How have you been treating your servant that owes you $16? Maybe you are the one who offended somebody. So, how have you been treating your servant with a $16 debt? No matter what anyone does to you, they'll never have the for, you'll never have to forgive any other person more than what God has already forgiven you. There's no offense on this earth that, you know, done to us that will be greater than our offense with God. When you think about forgiveness right now, who comes to your mind? <laughs> if it's somebody you, that you need to forgive, what are you going to do now? Now that you know the truth. That person is dead, Pastor. Well, he's not dead in your heart. So if the person is unreachable, then you need to find a friend, a trustworthy friend, a family member to talk and vent about what happened. And then before God, forgive that person. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> if the person is still alive, pray that God will give you an opportunity to reconcile. If the person is close with you, works with you, friends, then talk to the person. Forgive the person. Express to the person how you were offended. Because sometimes you need to vent. You need to say, listen, you said this. Because sometimes the person doesn't even know what they did. So tell the person, listen, you, what you said, what you did offended me. And I held a grudge against you. Please forgive me for that. And I forgive you as well for what you did. So that you may need to vent. So if the person is reachable, it's close to you, then do it today. Especially while this message is still fresh on your heart. What tangible action can you take to demonstrate forgiveness to someone who has hurt you in the past? 
what can you do? How can you express your thanks to God today for his forgiveness? So this all has to do with forgiveness. And this is what's going to liberate your heart. I can't preach on everything under the matter of forgiveness, but I gave you, I believe, just enough for you to waken you up and to help you to see why some of you struggle so much to forgive. It is because you feel that you deserve better. It's because you feel treated unfairly when you have been treating God so unfairly. It's because you fail to see the 60 or the $6 billion debt that you had that was forgiven. That's the problem. You fail to see it. But I hope that beginning today, after this message, you will not see it that way anymore. Don't turn around and demand others of a $16 debt that they have. Because remember, whatever it is that they owe you, it will never be greater than what we owed God. So, let it go. And let it go, why? Because people matter. The king loves you as, he, as much as he loves the one who offended you. You ever consider that? <laughs> He loves you both. So let it go. Jesus gives you the power to let it go. Amen. You received this today? <laughs> Glory to God. So what's next week's message? All for one, one for all. All for one and one for for all. Not the musketeers. <laughs> God. God is ready to heal some hurts this morning. I sense that this word, this was the, was the pivotal message that some of you needed to hear. And once it sinks into your heart, it's going to fill your heart with immense compassion and love towards all of those who offended you. It's already beginning right now. And then forgiveness for you will be very, very easy from now on. Because you understand now what you have been forgiven for. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. So I want to pray with you. Hmm. Glory to God. Amen. I, I, wow. Yes, Lord. I just heard the Spirit of God say this. Tell them that for some of you, unforgiveness is going to be an issue of the past. What did he mean by that? Some of you are going to leave here today because of this instruction. You're never again going to allow unforgiveness to be harbored in your heart. You're going to deal with it quickly, and you're going to walk in freedom. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you speak to us. And thank you, Father, that you're teaching us how to forgive. And Father, we accept this word here today, and I pray, Father, that all of us will leave here, Father, armed, equipped, ready to deal with issues that are still in our hearts and issues yet to come, offenses from other people that are still ahead of us. Lord, I thank you that we have the equipment now necessary, which is to give as the Lord has forgiven you. Hallelujah. We're so grateful this morning for this powerful, powerful truth, Lord, how much you forgave us.
how much you released us from. We were condemned. Your enemy shaped in sin. By our very works, we worked and we were opposed to you. Deserving hell. And yet, in your kindness and your goodness, simply because you loved us and you took pity on us, you forgave us and you assumed the debt yourself. What a message, Lord. What an incredible thing you did for us. Hallelujah. And we're so grateful this morning. And because of that, Lord, we know that we can now turn around and offer all those that owe us $16 <laughs> the same forgiveness for our $6 billion debt. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. Amen. So I pray, Father, that your people will never forget that number, 16 $16. And also never forget the six, six billion. That way, Father, they will always be reminded of what they have received freely. <laughs> as your word says, as you have freely received, freely give. So, Father, we freely receive huge forgiveness. This morning, we choose to freely give that same forgiveness. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, and everybody say amen. Woo! Amen. Glory to God. Now, when you leave here today, make sure you put this into practice. Okay? Go call that person. Email that person. Contact that person. Don't let the sun go down until you deal with it. Because now you're armed. You're armed. Amen? God bless your church. You're dismissed. Go in peace. See you Wednesday and next Sunday. Amen.